Greetings once again, my friends, and welcome back to Drac Vlogs. It's been a while. So the last time I was actually able to get together with you guys, I covered the third season of Voltron Legendary Defender. But uh, it's been a couple of months since that point, and there was actually another series that came out after that that I've been wanting to see for quite a while. That was the Defenders Season 1. Uh, so the Marvel Netflix universe, for lack of a better term, has finally hit its Avengers point. So we had Daredevil Season 1, Daredevil Season 2, which led into Jessica Jones Season 1, Luke Cage Season 1, and even Iron Fist Season 1, and then eventually leading into The Defenders. Sadly, I don't have coverage of every single one of those things, but I do have coverage for Luke Cage and Iron Fist. So if you guys want to see what I thought about those series, you're more than welcome to check that out. Um, and this is actually not going to be just like those where I actually did cover like every two episodes. Uh, I know a lot of people don't really like that format. And unfortunately, they kind of outweigh the people that do. Uh, and so unfortunately, I've decided just to do quite, kind of a quick summary vlog on my thoughts on the series as a whole. And at that point, I'm also going to res uh, resolve that I am going to be talking spoilers. If you haven't seen Defenders yet. I would recommend before watching this vlog that you do um, that way things don't not make sense to you. So at that point, spoiler warning ahead, uh, the way that I'm going to be handling the vlog is that we're going to be talking about character development specifically around the plot, um, but in particular towards the heroes, uh, because that's in a lot of cases how a, a lot of the story is shaped is through the experiences of um Matt Murdock, uh, Danny Rand, Jessica Jones, and Luke Cage. And in fact, one of the things that I really do like about the film, um, just talking about, or not about the film, but talking about the series in general, is that when they actually have their own spotlight moments, you get very unique coloring, uh, color schemes and, and shots very similar to how their series were shot. I actually wondered if they brought in the original directors for it um, for each series to be able to make sure to get those right. So you might not know what I'm actually talking about, but when Daredevil was alone, a lot of that stuff looked like it was, it wasn't shot in red, so to speak, but it looked like it was shot in Daredevil format. Like this, this was just another episode of Daredevil, but then you'd swap over to Jessica Jones and things would start looking the way that they do for a Jessica Jones episode with a little bit of a blue filter, or in some cases, a purple filter, uh, when Kilgrave was brought up, same thing for Luke Cage. Things would be do, done more golden and and yellow and and stuff like that. And the same goes for Danny Rand, where where greens would be used a little bit more. All of them felt like it, in individual efforts, they were done as part of their own series, and you could literally take them that way. But when you merge them together, then it actually started to become its own series it started to become its own shots its own individuality for it and so i did actually like the separation when these guys are not together but when they're together the shots get a little bit more uh, a little bit more diverse a little bit more interesting and therefore you get uh different kind of feelings out of each individual like where, where you might be feeling bad for danny in an individual shot in a, in a group shot you don't necessarily feel bad for him because he's got so many buddies around him the other thing that I want to get into is just kind of take the uh, the stuff outside of the character development. Uh, the next thing I want to go into is the actors themselves. Um, I've, again, seen IGN reviewers. I think I saw a Kotaku reviewer just go nuts on these guys, especially Finn Jones uh, for his portrayal of Danny Rand. Uh, I also know that a few people went nuts on the guy who plays Matt Murdock, and I just don't get the hatred there. I even said it in my iron fist review. I didn't have a problem with him playing Danny Rand. Um, and I didn't see the, uh, the problems that were being set there aside from maybe some character stuff, but it was the set within the context of that series. And again, the people start coming out and criticizing actors and actresses. I saw a few people criticizing, um, Electra or the, the actress who plays Electra criticizing, um, guy who plays Luke Cage, Finn Jones obviously gets brought up in a lot of that stuff. And I'm just going to be here to say that I didn't really see a bad performance from these guys. If you feel like there wasn't a good performance, in some cases I would actually say maybe that's not necessarily the problem with the actor, 
but more the story itself. Character development is kind of sparse in this one. It's really supposed to just be resolving things up to a bigger plot. And so a lot of people might be expecting to see a, a big character arc for every single individual person. And unfortunately, it didn't really happen. Um, more the arc was the story itself. So it's one of those things where I get some people were disappointed by that, but I wouldn't call that a bad performance. I really do think everybody gave the best performance they possibly could, given what they were, what they had to work with. I also will say this, uh, unlike a lot of the reviewers, I didn't hate the Defenders. I liked it. I thought it was as good as it was going to be. Um, in fact, given all the hype that was around it, I felt like the story worked uh, as, as a Defender story, as, you know, a TV Avengers kind of story. I actually liked how it worked out. I don't know necessarily what other people had the problem with. I enjoyed myself, and I was thoroughly entertained with every single twist that actually happened throughout the series. So that being said, let's go ahead and get into the uh, the character development, which I don't I want to try and keep this short so that I don't go into too many major plot developments. But I'm going to start things off with uh, Jessica Jones, who, again, I, I'm going to go from least to most as far as character development. And. I'm not saying that Jessica was a bad character to have in this, but. When I look at a character arc, you know, I want to actually see some changes happen. I want to see some revelations come to pass. And in Jessica's case, nothing really changes. I'm not saying that it needed to change or anything like that, but she isn't necessarily a different character at the end of it or have it, having different viewpoints. She's still just kind of stuck in the muck that she usually is. And I, I give major applause to the actress who plays her. I'm, the name escapes me whenever I do these vlogs. But um, I didn't have a problem with it, especially considering that when you look at it from Jessica, Jessica's perspective, she basically walked out of the whole Kilgrave incident into the hand trying to destroy New York. Yeah, same crap, different day. I, I, so in a lot of cases, I don't have a problem with what they did with her. In fact, she had some a lot of really great character moments in her interactions with some of the other actors. So. A lot of her stuff with Matt Murdock was actually really entertaining uh, just to be able to bounce off of each other. And, and occasionally, like she'd have the 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 moment where she'd forget she's that he's blind because, well, he doesn't really act like he's blind around her. And uh, the, the other moments, too, were, were she's being really snarky, but she's discovered who Daredevil is. And uh, she's being really snarky with him about uh either hiding it or to say like, why are you giving me crap about being a superhero when you're the one that walks around in tights at night? Um, when I don't want to do that. But aside from the snarkiness and all that, the character doesn't really change. In fact, no real moral, um, is given to Jessica aside from what she didn't already have. So that's why in a lot of cases, I don't think a whole lot of character development happened. I mean, even with the stuff that she has to believe in this series, and she was one of the main reasons that um, to to bring people up to speed, like Luke and Jessica walk in as absolute skeptics of the whole hand situation. The only reason that that Danny and Matt are not there is because they've had dealings with the hand. Um, they know the the they don't know necessarily all of the mystical stuff, but they know that the hand believes it, and that's all that needs to happen. So Luke and Jessica kind of walk in from this absolute skeptic point of view, and eventually a turn happens where Jess kind of confirms the stuff that's being said and even brings it to Luke, and it doesn't really even change her outlook on things. She she sees the mystical crap, and she's like, huh, well, this is one occurrence, and, and kind of moves on from it. So I like that idea. Uh, but she's still kind of stuck to her own. She still kind of dealt with things the way that Jessica normally deals with things. And so not a whole lot of development happened there. But I don't really think there needed to be for Jessica's character, especially given the crap she's already had to deal with. I think she just dealt with things in her own way, and it's how how we want her to do it, uh, deal with it. All right. Up next on that on that list is, well, Luke. Luke. uh he ha he actually does change over over the course of the arc in in the fact that he becomes an absolute skeptic at the beginning but then is more willing to believe when he finds out all of the harsh realizations of the hand and and the villains that he's dealing with 
But I also like the fact that he doesn't, because of this situation and because he knows what he's dealing with, he doesn't compromise his beliefs on the matter. <clears throat> um, he actually comes into the situation in, in an odd way where he's actually taking care of one particular leader of the hand and they kind of use his story to connect all of them together. And that was actually really well done, especially since that's also kind of the tool they use to get the defenders together. But then at the very end of it, even though he's seen all of this harsh murdery crap, he still sticks to his own beliefs in particular. Um, when they ultimately decide to blow up the mid Midland circle building and everybody's pretty much on the side of it. Minus uh, Danny, because Danny is not there. And Luke is always, is, is always sitting there. Just the voice of dissension. We can't blow this building up. It's going to affect New York and it's going to affect New York in ways that you can't even begin to fathom. And I like the fact that he did that because they did need to have that voice. They, despite who they were dealing with, they needed to have that voice to be able to have that dissension and have that level of conscience into it. So I like the fact that even though crap is changing all around Luke, he doesn't really change in his morals. Um, that, that actually does help, especially in his interactions with Danny and with Matt. His interactions also with Jessica were really beautiful because they address an issue that was never taken care of in either Jessica's or Luke's series. Because in Jessica's series, Luke and Jessica get, to get get together because of their superpowers and then kind of separate because um, Luke finds out that Jessica killed her, killed his wife. Uh, but then comes back later and has to deal with the whole Kilgrave incident and now actually understands why Jessica kind of kept that to herself. And so I like the fact that they had that resolution that, you know, he did kind of walk away from Jessica not because of the whole, not because she was necessarily a bad person, but because of the situation that was shaped around her. And they never really resolved it in the Luke Cage series. She was never shown in it. So I like the fact that they did resolve the fact that he did walk out on Jessica and Jessica essentially walked out on Luke too. Um, in particular, they have kind of this last, uh, like during the end of the series, they have a like a bar scene where they both get together and explain, you know, this is what happened. And, and Luke actually willingly admits, yeah, I was a jerk to you. And uh, I had to go and deal with my own stuff. And I didn't necessarily bring you into that. And I am sorry, but I still want to be friends with you. I like that. I actually thought it was a really touching scene considering, you know, this was again down in the dumps, Jessica again. And I felt like that even she walked away with something from it, not something ultimately that changed her, but at least knew she maybe had another person to talk to kind of thing. Uh, so I, that's the thing is like, I don't really feel like a whole lot of development happened for Luke just because he kind of stuck to his guns and he was needed to stuck to, to stick to his guns. I should also mention his interactions with Claire were really beautiful. And the fact he just barely got out of prison and he didn't want to do anything to go back. In fact, he actually wanted to lay low. He didn't want to get involved with saving Harlem or saving anybody else. He wanted to live his life with Claire and uh, Claire essentially brings him back into the fold, not only with telling him to go help out the de um, detective Knight, but also in taking on the case that he takes to eventually meet Danny Rand and thus the defenders. So I did like the relationship interactions we got with the two of them. And it felt like a real legitimate relationship, especially from Claire's end where she's getting so frustrated because so many things are required of Luke that she doesn't want to be involved with. <coughs> she spent a majority of these series trying to get out of the crosshairs and consistently finds herself in them. Uh, this started in Daredevil season one, and she's basically shown up. Rosario Dawson has shown up in every single series having some kind of issue some way or another. And so in a lot of cases, you feel bad for her, but you actually do want this relationship to, to succeed. So I do like the character development that happened there as well. All right, up next, 
my favorite one, Matt Murdock, a.k.a. Daredevil, a.k.a. the Devil of, Hell, Devil of Hell's Kitchen, a.k.a. Blind Lawyer, which is 80% of what he gets called in The Defenders. Um, f- The way things start out for him, it's kind of beautiful, the conflict that he actually goes through the entire series. Because, uh, as you guys can be able to imagine, Jessica Jones, Luke Cage, and Iron Fist have happened in between Daredevil Season 2. And the way things were left on Daredevil season two is that he was hanging up the cape and cowl, so to speak. He wasn't going to do it anymore. It was destroying his life. He couldn't be a lawyer. He couldn't hang out with Foggy. He couldn't hang out with Karen. He couldn't do any of that stuff. He couldn't have relationships. He wasn't even interested in having a relationship because he just buried Elektra. Um, and so he was starting to put his life back on the straight and narrow, if you want to call it that, like where he wasn't being a superhero. And you see him kind of struggle with it. And I actually, one of the things I really do like with it is that even though he cares about Karen and Foggy, you kind of get the feeling from both of them that they don't care about him. And part of that is because he never told them. I like that idea that they they kind of feel very detached, even when eventually <clears throat> um, the defenders are worried about their loved ones getting targeted by the hand and actually start rounding them all up and bringing them into the police department to be watched by detective Knight. And so for daredevil's end, I mean, Claire, obviously, but you get Karen and foggy and they care more about what they're going through than they necessarily care about daredevil. And in fact, when uh, foggy eventually helps out Matt to resolve, to resolve all of this by giving him the suit, Karen chastises him. Saying, why are you enabling this when we're trying to get him to step away from this life? And I liked the development that Matt went through. He he had to struggle with the fact he didn't want to get back involved into this stuff, but he was forced into it because Electra's alive again. He needs to solve that. But on top of that, he needs to do it because he loves his city. And I appreciate that so much with that character. This is, this is why I love this character so much than the Ben Affleck, Matt Murdock. I love this guy. He actually feels like Daredevil to me. And so that internal struggle is an amazing thing to happen. And his resolutions are great because you get to see him literally figure them out and, and cross each threshold as he goes. And it, it's understandable why he goes that route. Eventually, since uh, Stick comes back and basically says, you need to lead these guys. You know the hand, and you're probably the most competent of them mentally, so you should probably just be leading them. And he takes it up, and he eventually embraces the Daredevil persona again, and uh, it's a whole different series when he does that. So I do applaud uh, Matt Murdock's character development, especially with the last scene tr- uh, twist where we actually thought he may have given his all for New York. Finally, not so much. He's off somewhere. We don't really know where I guess that'll be solved in daredevil season three. I don't know. Is, is daredevil season three happening? Second to last is probably the hero that got the most development out of this entire affair, at least as far as I'm concerned. And trust me, that was a tie between him and Matt is Danny Rand, a.k.a. Iron Fist. Now, I still remember all the people getting so pissy with Finn Jones on his performance. And again, I didn't understand it then, and I certainly don't understand it now, because he was able to deliver even more with the revelations that came after Iron Fist ended, with the destruction of Kunlun, and the fact that he now needs to obliterate the hand, and he is on his own. He can't re- rely on the monks anymore. He has got to protect um, both the Iron Fist as well as those whom he loves. Um, I love the fact that him and Colleen basically kind of go globetrotting at the beginning to try and track down what happened to Kunlun, and that leads them back to New York. But then I also like the fact that he actually goes through a really weird roller coaster arc uh, of emotions throughout the whole Defenders thing. Because when they get together, he's like the most optimistic. He's he's sitting there going, you know, you're bulletproof. You are a blind ninja and you are a, a woman with superpowers. Why shouldn't we get together? He's like the one that's trying to bring them all together. And then at the end, he's actually more encouraging them to be apart. 
um, to go and do their own solo thing. So it's an interesting art to be able to go through, especially when things happen that he realizes, well, he can be friends with them, but he doesn't know if he can necessarily trust every single one of them. Um, I also do like the fact that his internal conflict from the series carries into here, that he really feels like he has no home. And at the end of it, because of uh, the things they have to deal with with the hand, he now feels like New York is more his home. And uh, I have a feeling that that audiences were able to live kind of vicariously through Colleen when she said when she hears that and then gives him that big embrace It's like he can finally embrace uh, New York as his new home and uh, start establishing a family here, including being like an individual hero in his own right. But the biggest revelation for him is is the realization that maybe, um, yes, the hand is truly evil, but not necessarily that every element is as evil as he was led to believe. Um, obviously there are elements like Bakudo that comes back and, uh, a few other like Madame Gao that are evil to him. But then he also can look at, uh, Colleen's situation and say, yes, this is not necessarily the most evil thing in the world. And neither is, uh, cause I think he actually begins it hating the chaste and then eventually kind of, I think gains respect as all of them do for stick at the end of it. But, um, I actually do like the arc that he went through, especially in the concept when it's very late in the game, figured out that the hand need Danny. And the purpose here is to not let them have Danny, but Danny wants to fight. And so one moment in particular that I liked is they all kind of gang up on him to, to capture him so that he won't go out and do something reckless. This is where he actually begins to not want to be a team anymore. And it is, it's told brilliantly because, again, he's, he's a warrior. He wants to be on the front lines, and they're telling him he can't be. This is, the, this is pretty much every single thing that he had to deal with in his own series. And I love, it, I love him for it and how he interacted. I also do like his interactions with Luke. I know that they're trying to set up the whole Heroes for Hire kind of thing between the two of them. And it's rocky and awkward, but I like it. It felt real. It felt like these guys, these two were getting to know each other more than um, than him and Matt, than him and Jessica. In fact, I would actually dare say that Jessica and Matt took more time to get to know each other. Same thing with, uh, with I want to say Finn, but no, it's uh, with Danny and Luke. I really do like all of those interactions, especially since a lot of the re revelations we get later, why they needed the Iron Fist. It makes a lot of sense why they need him and also why he needed to be protected. And he even acknowledges it later on that. Yeah, maybe he actually did need to not be brought into this situation because all he did was make it worse kind of thing. So I did really like that development. Um, if there was a complaint that I have and it's a minor one because again, I like the, the development they did for them anyway, but it would be the hand themselves. Um, basically the, so we're dealing with the five fingers of the hand. So the five great leaders of it. And some of them, we already know we, we know Gao and we know Bakudo. We then get introduced to Zawande, who is the, like an African warlord kind of guy. And most of his interactions are with Luke. Um, then we also get to meet Murakami, who I don't think has been introduced into the series, but he's like Nobu's boss. So that's kind of the connection to Daredevil is because Daredevil dealt with Nobu all the time. And finally, we have Alexandra, who is the main focus of the, the hand scenes in the series. And she's played by Sigourney Weaver. And again, the performance is really, really good. But unfortunately, since basically the hand is immortal they just kind of treat them as like they're you know we're we're evil because we're immortal and we want to stay immortal and uh, that's the only things that we actually care about so does it feel as elaborate as say what kingpin was doing in daredevil not really i'm not saying it hurts it but bakudo definitely felt more menacing in the iron fist series than he did here and i would actually say the same thing goes for gao but kind of in a two handed way, because we also got to see Gao actually do stuff. And that was kind of intimidating to see, but we didn't get enough of it. And I was a little disappointed. Murakami just comes off as um, Nobu, but maybe a little bit more reckless. So I, I, I don't want to even want to say he was better or worse than Nobu. 
And Alexandra is just the manipulator behind all of it, especially in regards to Electra. Uh, she manipulates her and then eventually is killed by her uh, so that Electra can pursue what Alexandra was pursuing all along, immortality and, and being able to live forever. So that's that's my only complaint with it is I'm not saying the villains were bad by any sense, but they're not the most memorable thing either. I would actually say a lot of my favorite moments were uh, the four of them getting together and developing, but not so much for the hand. It was just it was bitter squabbling most of the time. Anyway, so th that's my thoughts on Defenders Defender season one. I don't know if we're going to get a season two, but I thought it was worthwhile and I would wholeheartedly recommend anybody who hasn't seen the series to at least give it a shot. Give the first couple of episodes a try, wait uh, at least until they get together and see where you stand with it. If you don't like it, then I completely understand. But I think I've got talked you guys' ear off far too long in this episode, so I'll go ahead and wrap up here. When we get back for Drag Vlogs, we will be taking on the fourth season of Voltron Legendary Defender. We'll see you guys then.